welcome to those who may be watching online this morning. In the blue book, 262, 262, trusting in Jesus. <laughs>
Verse 39. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this gospel we've been able to explore and the things we've learned so far. We pray, Lord, you'll speak to us and show us things from your word this morning. Just to learn and grow, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark 15, 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. And the other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. 
When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And very early, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. We'll stop there. So, when the centurion stood there in front of Jesus, he cried these words, Surely this man was the Son of God. <clears throat> now, centurions, they were kind of hardened soldiers. You know, you, you wouldn't, you don't appoint a centurion, but you had to work your way up the ranks to be a centurion. And a uh, centurion was a soldier that was over 100 men. That's why the, the, it comes from the word century, 100, you know. So, <clears throat> he, this was a soldier who had proven his worth uh, to the Romans. He's, he made his way, you know, to the point of being over a hundred people. And this day he was in charge of uh, the execution party that was happening in the three, there were three different executions. And uh, unfortunately, these kinds of centurions were had done this thing kind of thing over and over and over again so they kind of been hardened to it you know and cold and watch people die all the time um but he had been watching jesus and you know all the events that surrounded jesus all day and we have no idea you know what may have opened his heart um but just you know, as God tore open the veil that day, he must have done something, tore open this man's heart to really see the truth, you know, of what was going on here. And just like the, the one of the criminals on the cross next to Jesus, at some point he changed his tune as well. And, you know, it says at first that he was among the mockers. And then at some point he... Uh, decided that Jesus was innocent and, and he got converted and so something like this must have happened to the centurion as well. It, yeah. It says in uh, Luke that he praised God and then he uh, and then he said that. He praised what? Praised, praised God. Oh, praised God? Uh-huh. Oh. Uh -huh. He said the centurion seeing what had happened, praised God and said, fear me this was a righteous man. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps earlier he had witnessed things. I mean, Jesus had had his ministry over three years, and being a centurion, you know, he might have been appointed somewhere where he heard Jesus preach, or maybe even saw one of his miracles. Maybe that was the starting point. But even if this was the first encounter that he had with Jesus here, there was a lot of things that happened that day. And probably, you know, just things that, like I said, since he had seen this kind of thing over and over again, saw that something was different about this situation, you know. Um, the way that Jesus interacted with those that were mocking him and spitting on him and crucifying him, you know, just the kind of attitude he had on the cross. He had to have heard, you know, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, that must have, you know, touched him probably. Um, he also probably heard, you know, when that criminal uh, came to the Lord and got saved and that whole conversion. Um, and the darkness that we talked about last week, you know, that fell over the land at high noon. Um, so... Through all these things, you know, Jesus kept his faith, you know, and his attitude stayed in check all the way till his last breath, you know, so he witnessed all these things and um, perhaps it was one thing that convinced him or maybe it was just all the little things added up together, but to say these words, you know, surely this was the Son of God. Now. He was a pagan, you know, and his con his confession here might be 
tied to pagan ideas, you know, about the gods. I mean, the Romans believed in all kinds of gods. So for him to say he was the son of God, you know, it might have not been as theological as, as we think that it's sounding here. But on the other hand, it could have been. You know, um, he probably was aware that this is one of the things that Jesus actually was accused of. I mean, that's why the Romans put him on the cross, because he was claiming to be a king, claiming to be the son of God. You know, on the, the Jewish trial, that was the thing that put him over the edge to go ahead and hand him over to the Romans, because, remember, the high priest asked Jesus specifically, are you the Messiah, the son of God? And he said, yes, I am. So he probably was aware of that, being in charge of everything. He probably was aware of you know, all the things that Jesus was sentenced for and, and all those kinds of things. So he may have understood exactly, you know, that what Jesus was claiming to be and, and understood that way. But there's no doubt that Mark wants us to, to think that when we read that. Remember, Mark's the one writing this gospel. And when he's recording that, he wants us to see that this secular man, you know, proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of God. Um, and what's interesting is this is how Mark started his gospel. So if you go back to the beginning, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it's right there because it says, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So he uses that term, Son of God, you know, the very first verse of his gospel. So that's kind of his, his theme, I think, that he's trying to push. You know, all the different writers kind of have their their theme that they push up. Matthew was all about Jesus being king. And uh, Mark, you know, emphasizes him being the, the son of God. And also, in verse 11 of that first chapter, the father says, You are my son, too, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So, Mark's gospel, you know, emphasizes how he was called the, the, the son of God. And the centurion was correct, you know, in what he said. And um, and that's exactly what happened. The son of God died on our behalf and demonstrated who he was at that moment, bearing our sin. And then verse 40 says, some women were watching from a distance, among them Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome, in Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were there also. So, if you compare all the gospel accounts together, you can kind of figure out who these women were. Uh, separately, you can't really figure it out, but if you compare them all, because they all call them different things. So, if you compare Matthew, uh, John, and Mark together, it seems to indicate that Salome was the mother of, of uh, James and John. Remember James and John, um, the two Zebedee boys. Uh, John is the one also that wrote the gospel. And then James, his brother, was the one that got beheaded um, right after Stephen did. Herod beheaded him. But um, Remember, she had come to Jesus earlier and said, uh, could you give my two sons the right and left-hand seats of your throne? Uh, this, this is that woman. So, um, Salome. And um, so, and also if you compare them, it looks like she was Mary's sister. Because one of the Gospels says it's Mary's sister. So um, it looks like John and Jesus were cousins, if that's true. I mean, we can't be 100% certain but they name these certain women and each one names the women and so one of them says it's Mary's sister the other one says Salome and the other one says the mother of James and John so if you put it together it's, you know that this is probably Mary's sister and that John was Jesus cousin and then you have Mary the mother of James the younger and Joseph well who's that well if you compare the other accounts Mary uh, the wife of Clopas, it says. And James the Younger, he was one of the twelve as well. So he's the James, the son of Alphaeus. 
He doesn't get talked about a whole lot. But remember, there was two Jameses. You had James, the son of Zebedee, and you had James, the son of Alphaeus. So this is James, the son of Alphaeus. And, um, and uh, so anyway, she was married to this guy named Clopas. Now, there's another person that was there as well. A Mark and Matthew don't mention her, but it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, of course. John is the only one that mentions her. And um, why don't these other, why don't Matthew and Mark mention her? Well, probably because, remember in John's account, when Jesus is up on the cross, he says to John, this is your mother now. And so he kind of is saying in that moment, you need to take care of my mom. You know? So maybe at that point, he took her away and she didn't stay. Because what Mark and Matthew were describing, the end of the crucifixion when he died, maybe uh, his, um, Jesus' mother wasn't there all the way to the end. Maybe she was there at the beginning. John took her away. And then these are the only women that are still there. So that's kind of one way to kind of make sense of it all. You know, when you try to, they have, a, they have these harmonies of the gospel. We can put everything together and see. It's kind of interesting, but then it also raises a lot of questions because it's like, well, how come this person doesn't do this and that? <laughs> but there's a way to figure it out. So that, that's one way to kind of sort all that out anyway. And then verse 42 says it was preparation day. That's the day before the Sabbath. So the Jews were concerned about, you know, a body being left on a cross that kind of contradicted, you know, what the Old Testament talked about. A body needed to be buried. So somehow the Romans um, worked out an agreement with the Jews because normally the, the Romans would leave the bodies up there for three or four days because part of the reason why they came up with this uh, idea of crucifixion was to draw out this prolonged death as long as they could. And so that was part of the torture was that you had to stay up there three or four days, you know, before you died. And so it was this long drawn out process. But Jesus actually died after six hours. And that's why, you know, Pilate shocked because it was unusual that that, that, that happened. Um, so uh, they must have agreed, uh, the Jewish leaders probably came to terms with the Romans on this, on the special holidays. You have to remember this is Passover week. And then also it's the, the Sabbath is coming up. Um, so they took down the bodies, you know, before the Sabbath. And Jesus um, had, was already dead, so that's fulfilled a prophecy that said that none of his bones would be broken because they would break the legs of the of the guys that uh, were still alive. But since Jesus was already dead, they didn't do that. So, And then this request comes uh, for Jesus' body to be taken down and buried. So normally executions of this kind, they would just be buried in a common grave because these were criminals most of the time, you know. Jesus being the exception, but um, being criminals, they weren't given honor or respect in their burial, so they just had this kind of common grave where they put them all in. Um, so, like I said, you know, the, the guys came by and they broke the, the legs of the two guys that were on opposite of Jesus, because the reason for that was is that you had to push yourselves up to get breath so you had to leave, use your legs to push yourself up to, to get another breath of air so if they broke their legs then they would just suffocate and die so that's why they broke their legs um, but when they get to Jesus they realize he's already dead um, but to make sure of that the soldier takes a spear and thrusts it in his side and that's not Mark's account but that's I think it's John's account that says that now, while this is going on, we're introduced to this man in verse 42, Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea was a place about 20 miles from Jerusalem to the north. 
In Joseph, it says well, he was a man of, uh, of great power. Another gospel account says he was a man of great wealth. Um, Mark tells us he was a prominent member of the council. So the council is the Sanhedrin. So he was one of the uh, members of the, the Sanhedrin. And um, we know by one of the other gospel accounts, he's also well, wealthy. The Sanhedrin made up uh, a group of men, 70 to 71, scholars differ, but it's either 70 or 71 uh, members. But he was a prominent member of the, of the Sanhedrin. And so he was responsible for making, you know, significant choices that went on in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, all the things that they had to decide, kind of like our Congress or something, you know, they make all these decisions about things for the nation. So that's kind of what the Sanhedrin did. Um, and uh, somehow, some way, he became a secret follower of Jesus. Mark tells us in verse 43, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Uh, Luke tells us also that he was a good and upright man who had not consented to the council's decision and action against Jesus. So we're not told if he just, you know, they might have voted on whether to condemn Jesus. Maybe he just didn't raise his hand or maybe he got, maybe he was verbal about what they were trying to do against, well, whatever, he was against the decision, you know, to have Jesus crucified. Uh, but he was a secret disciple because he feared the Jews. So, but something happened, you know, when Jesus died that uh, made him get a little more bold, you know. Maybe he was angry for the injustice that was being done to Jesus, what the Sanhedrin had voted on that he voted against. And, um, and he was angry about that, so he's standing up more now for Jesus. It's kind of too late, but at least he's doing it here. But, um, or maybe the grief of Jesus dying, you know, maybe that was part of it that got to him. Um, maybe it was his guilt. Maybe he felt guilty because he hadn't stood up for Jesus until he had died, and then he wanted to do something now that he was dead. Um, but whatever the case, he, he was motivated at least to honor Jesus in his death. You know, we still do that kind of thing today. You know, if someone was in the military or something, they get this uh, honorable death, you know. And uh, so he wanted to honor Jesus in his death. He didn't want to fly thrown in a, just a common grave. So he actually gives Jesus his own tomb that was made for him. Um, and it fulfilled the prophecy in Scripture. So this was written 700 years earlier in Isaiah's writing in the 53rd chapter, verse 9. It says, He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was buried with the rich man in his death. So, um, so he was, uh, you know, would have been thrown with the rest of the criminals, but Joseph offered his tomb, so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's we talk about the burial of Jesus, and then we talk about the tomb. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't bury people in the ground, did they? Very nice. I think so. Very the awful. common, the common ones, yeah, like the criminals. I think they did. So you had to be rich to have a tomb. Yeah. Well, sometimes yeah. there was caves too, but yeah, this was. Right. It says this was a hewn out tomb. That they actually carved out this tomb in a rock. Yeah. And they put people in there on the slab, didn't they? Yeah, usually they would, like your whole family would be buried in the same tomb. What they would do is if you were buried and then after your body decomposed and it was, the skeleton was left, then they would put the skeleton in a box. Uh -huh. I think it was called an ossuary or something uh -huh. like that. But anyway, they put them in a box. And then that would leave space for somebody else to be laid there. But sometimes they would have two or three places that where they could be laid. Um, <clears throat> so, for instance, you go to Jerusalem today, 
there is a garden, and it has a rich man's tomb from the first century. There's no way to know if this was actually Jesus' tomb, but it was a rich man's tomb, and it was a tomb that was carved out of the rock, just like this says. But if you go in the tomb, there's two places there where you could put at least a couple of different bodies in there. Um, but the scriptures say that Jesus was the first one, you know, no one had ever been laid in this tomb, so it was pure, it was, you know, had never been contaminated by a dead body or whatever, you know, it was just a brand new tomb, and Jesus was the first one to be laid in there. But it also goes against, you know, people try to say, like sometimes there was, they were buried in caves, and they would say, well, somebody came on the other side of the cave and took his body away or something, but this could have been like that because this was carved out of a rock, so there wasn't any back entrances or anything, you know. This was a, just a, a rock that had been carved out, so. Um, so Joseph didn't want Jesus to die, you know, um, the way the criminals, without respect, so he takes advantage of this opportunity. He uses his, his uh, position as far as a member of the council, and um, goes to Pilate, gets access to Pilate. Probably, you know, a lot of people probably weren't able to get access to Pilate, but him being who he was, he had an audience with Pilate, so he met with him and he asked for his body. So this was a courageous thing for him to do, at least in death, because many of his friends found out that he had done this. You know, he was going to hear about it. So he did stand up here. Um, because he wanted to honor Jesus, and it says Pilate um, was surprised that Jesus was already dead, so he wanted to make sure he wasn't just going to go by Joseph's word here, so he calls in the centurion that, you know, said that he was the son of God. He calls him in and says, is Jesus really dead? And he said yes. So, with his confirmation, you know, he, um, he let Joseph take his body. Uh, so Joseph uh, went back to the cross along with Nicodemus. It's not in this text, but um, in the other gospel accounts, it says that he and Nicodemus went together. Nicodemus was also a member of the Sanhedrin. And they took the body down from the cross. And they would have followed the, the normal customs. Um, of the day, which was they would wash the body and prepare it. Now, they only had a few hours because the Sabbath was coming, but um, they did what they could. But they washed the body and then they would wrap it in this linen and prepare it with spices. Now, John's account tells us that Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of a mixture of myrrh and aloes. That is a lot of spices. So, 75 pounds worth. And then they placed the body in the tomb that had been cut out of a rock. So that's an important detail, you know. It was uh, that kind of a tomb that was cut out of a rock. And it was someone that was rich. So. And um, it had never been used before. It was new. And we're told that there was a stone that was rolled in the entrance. They usually had this groove that was set in front of the tomb, and the stone would roll into that groove. So it was, wasn't easy to move the stone back and forth once it was in that groove. But we also know that from the other accounts that it was sealed, that the, the Jewish leaders had asked for the Romans to put the seal on it so that they could prove that no one would come and take the body. Um, and we're told here that two women named Mary, everybody's named Mary, but Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, they were watching from a distance. They were watching Joseph and Nicodemus put the body in the tomb, so they knew where he was. Um, so then uh, these two women, along with Salome, they were, you know, they did a lot for Jesus. They were the last ones with him until he died, and then they were the first ones at the tomb. And um, after Sabbath was over, you know, they, they went and bought these spices, 
Um, all the stores would have been closed. They weren't able to do that, and they didn't have enough time. And maybe they didn't know. I mean, maybe they didn't know that Joseph and Nicodemus had anointed the body, or maybe they just wanted to do it themselves, you know, for their own personal reasons. But... Um, This day, you know, the Sabbath day must have been really hard on all of Jesus' followers. You know, they were all, it says they met together in a room, and it must have been just a day of anguish. Everyone's crushed, you know, all their plans, all the, the, the ideas they had. Of, they were following Jesus, and they thought he was going to bring in this kingdom and overthrow the Romans, and probably had all kinds of ideas of where this was going, and then it suddenly, you know, it all ended in their minds because they they didn't remember Jesus' words. And this is what I can't understand. But several times Jesus had said, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to raise again. But nobody seemed to pick up on what he said. But anyway, these three women, they want to harm Jesus' body. So as soon as Sabbath was over, they got the spices and... Um, Sometimes when you're dealing with grief, you know, the best thing, too, is to just get busy doing something. And maybe so they they want to go and do this to anoint Jesus' body. And so the first chance they get, they they go to the store and they, they buy these spices. Maybe they want some closure, too, you know, to see the body one more time. Um, some people like to have, like, an open casket to say goodbye. Um, others don't. It's it's a little bit weird. And when my grandma died, you know, because they do all these things to the body, and it didn't look like my grandma after they were done with her, you know, because she, she didn't hardly wear makeup, and they had all this makeup on her, and she totally looked different. But in a way, it was good at the same time, because everyone, you know, had a chance to kind of say goodbye to her, and but maybe that was part of the reason they wanted to say goodbye to Jesus' body. And so they go to the, to the tomb to do this very early on Sunday morning. So you have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, these three women again, just after sunrise. So. <coughs> and we're going to stop there. Anyone have any questions or comments before we go? Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we uh, just so grateful for all that Jesus did on the cross to save us from our sins and to give us eternal life. And um, we are so ever grateful for all those things and seeing all the prophecies come true in Scripture and all the things that were being fulfilled. And, Pray as we go into our time of worship today that you would just help our, our minds to be focused and just have the, the right attitude, help us to be grateful, and, and um, that you can be honored and we just give you all the praise this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.